Okay. Um, thank you very much. I, my name is Kate Mills. I am at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience here in London, where I study brain development. And specifically, I'm interested in the period of adolescence, which we can define as beginning around puberty and ending when one's attained a relatively stable, uh, independent role in society. And I was really excited to be uh, asked to discuss this very large question in 15 minutes. Um, what do we know about the effects of internet use and network culture on the adolescent brain? So I'm sure many of you have seen headlines like these making very scary claims that scientists know that the internet is rewiring our brains, that it's affecting typical development. There's actually a few um, books written on this topic. And there are neuroscientists out there making very scary claims like the internet is destroying your brain. And I want to make another claim about this, and some of you might disagree with me, and I, I think that's great. I think this is a discussion we should all have together. Um, and I just wanted to tell you about this before the rest of my talk. I don't think we know much at all about how the internet or network culture is affecting the adolescent brain. And so what I'm going to do for most of my time up here is give everyone a crash course on what we do know about the adolescent brain, and then afterwards, uh, talk about how we can begin to start thinking about measuring things like internet use and network culture and how that might affect the adolescent brain. And I, there are three key things that I want to tell you today. Uh, the adolescent brain is undergoing substantial development. How we navigate social interactions is changing across this time. And the adolescent brain is still sensitive to environmental influences. Okay, so for a long time, we thought that the brain was fully developed by early childhood. But luckily, this wonderful technology called magnetic resonance imaging came about, and now we can see how the living, developing human brain is changing across the entire lifespan. And we know from using this technology that the brain is undergoing substantial structural change and functional change during adolescence. And I'll unpack that a bit more. Okay, so, um, with MRI, we can take many types of pictures, and one type of picture we can take is of the structure or the anatomy of the brain. And we can measure how separate uh, these main components, gray matter, which is thought to contain brain cell bodies and connections, and white matter, which is made up of the long fibers that connect brain regions together. Uh, and it gets uh, the word, my, the, the white and white matter comes from myelin, which wraps around these fibers to make them more efficient at signaling. And so uh, these are two things that we can measure with structural MRI. And this graph here uh, shows gray matter volume changes in both females in red and males in blue across childhood and adolescence. And there have been a few studies now where hundreds of participants have had their brain scanned multiple, uh, multiple times across development. And we know from these studies that gray matter volume is at its highest in childhood, and it's decreasing across adolescence before stabilizing in around the mid to late 20s. White matter volume, as you can see here, increases almost linearly across adolescence. And so these are two major structural changes that are happening at this time. And these changes are not occurring in the same place or at the same time across the entire brain. It's actually uh, some parts of the brain that are involved in more sim uh, simple or processes like our senses or movement. They're developing much faster or much earlier than areas of the brain in kind of the prefrontal cortex here um, and the temporal lobe here, uh, which are involved in many complex processes like thinking about the future, uh, inhibiting inappropriate behavior, and understanding other people. So as you'll see in this quick video, um, these areas are changing more in adolescence than in childhood, and this video is from a group in Oslo. So as you can see, the yellow, which represents the most gray matter change, is moving from areas in the back, which are involved in sen basic sensory processing, to areas in the front, like the prefrontal cortex and temporal cortex. Okay. We also know that the brain is changing in its organization and function during adolescence, which relates to performance in a number of domains. But I want to focus on the social domain in particular because of its relevance to the question, how does the, how does the internet or network culture affect the adolescent brain? Now, adolescence is a time of change in how we navigate the social environment. We start hanging out with our peers more. We're more we value their opinions 
much more during this time. We start to worry about or think about how others are perceiving us and our self-identity. And this is completely adaptive behavior. So I use the word navigate quite purposefully um, because if we think about the end point of adolescence as attaining this in independent, roughly stable uh, role in society, in a species as social as our own, we must be very good at navigating complex social relationships. And there are a, uh, there is a number of cognitive processes that are involved in interacting with and understanding other people. And we can use functional MRI to see what areas of the brain are uh, engaged when we do uh, certain important social tasks, such as trying to understand emotions or intentions behind facial expressions, or thinking about uh, social emotions such as guilt or embarrassment. And tasks like these consistently recruit areas in the prefrontal cortex and temporal cortex. And in our lab, we call this the social brain. Uh, and we know from studies like the one I showed you earlier, but also from studies that we've conducted in our lab, that these areas of the social brain are changing substantially in their structure across adolescence, as you can see here. And although adolescents and adults use the same areas of the brain, so they, they both use the social brain when doing tasks that, involve, that require us understanding other people, um, actually, adolescents are different in how much they recruit this area of the prefrontal cortex. So across many different studies, so what you see here is this, uh, it's a meta-analysis of a couple of different studies showing that um, when adolescents are doing the tasks listed here, they're using this area of the prefrontal cortex more than adults. OK, so the third point I want to make about the adolescent brain is that it is still sensitive to environmental influences. And what I'm showing here is an image from a study looking at postmortem brain tissue. Uh, and this was conducted at the Croatian Institute for Brain Research. And this painstaking work involves counting the number of dendritic spines. And dendritic spines are where we find synapses, which you can think of as the connection points between brain cells. So they counted the number of these spines um, in uh, an area of the prefrontal cortex in brains across many ages. And what they and others have found is that we have the greatest number of connection points in childhood and early adolescence. And many of these connection points are lost across adolescence, and they don't really reach the adult level until the end of the third decade. So this means that we have an excess amount of connections in childhood, and we can lose almost half of these connections during adolescence. And we refer to this process as synaptic pruning. And we know that experience influences what connections are kept and what connections are lost. And really, this isn't a negative thing. It's really more of a trade-off. So we lose these unused connections, but the connections that are kept are strengthened because uh, myelin is increasing around the connections that have been kept. OK, so I hope that was a helpful crash course in the adolescent brain for everyone. Let's go back to the main question. What do we know about the impact of these specific environmental factors, internet use, and network culture on the adolescent brain? And so this is a very cliche visualization of uh, the internet and its interlinking beauty. And I have a really hard time saying that we know anything about how using the internet is affecting the brain, because to me, the internet is made up of a lot of things. And as a scientist, I wonder, you know, how do we measure internet use? Is, um, oh, is this on here? Uh, and how can we disentangle all the things that are involved with internet use? So is internet use time spent looking at screens? Is internet use time spent physically immobile, which we know can affect both the developing and the adult brain? Is internet use shallow browsing? So I, this seems to be one of the big fears about the internet, that instant access to information is making us all very inattentive and sh you know, have very shallow knowledge and sort of deep knowledge about topics. And this reminds me of what Socrates warned his students that writing stuff down was going to ruin their memory. They would not be able to remember anything because they're using this new technology writing stuff down. Uh, and it feels like when new technologies are introduced and become kind of widespread, uh, older generations fear the developing uh, generation that has been brought up with this new technology. And so I'm, I, I think that this is something to, to think about. And given that, the, that there's a large presence of the internet in many societies, 
where many functional adults use the internet daily for both social and work reasons, is internet use just another form of tool use? And I think this was echoed before in some previous sessions. Um, so to give everyone an example of a clever study that I believe gets at, a, at the question of how internet use can be affecting our brains, this is a study by Betsy Sparrow and her colleagues, and they were trying to measure the Google effect. So how having access to information affects our ability to remember specific information. And a group of undergraduate students were given a list of bits of information, like an ostrich's eyeball is bigger than its brain, and they were also shown the location where some of this information would be saved, in, in computer folders. Now, they had to memorize all this information, and there was a lot of information, but not as many folders, if that makes sense. And they were told they would be quizzed later to recall the information, but half of them were told that they would have access to this information during the quiz. And the students who expected to have future access to the information were more likely to remember the location, but not the actual information itself. And so this study provides scientific evidence for the Google effect. And now I think we just need to ask ourselves, how do we feel about this? OK, so I just want to talk very briefly about networked culture and what being constantly connected can mean uh, for the adolescent brain. And really, I just want to come back to the concept of navigating our social environment and tool use. So just like with the internet, being connected can be thought of as a tool. And adolescents are not passive creatures helpless to environmental influences. And I think this is a very big issue. So there seems to be a lot of talk about how the environment affects adolescent brain development, and not as much talk about how adolescents interact with environmental factors like the internet, like network culture, in order to strengthen skills and connections that are necessary to navigate the social environment into successful adulthood. Um, and I think that there are many examples of adolescents using network culture and the internet as tools. So this is one website um, that connects young people uh, to be peer mentors and discuss mental health issues. I'm sure many of you know of the uh, site started by a teenager named Tavi Gevinson, uh, Sio Rookie, which is a website where adolescent girls can discuss issues that matter to them. And I'm sure we can find a lot more examples here at the marathon of how young people have used the internet and network culture um, as tools. So I just want to oh, thank you again for having me here, and I uh, thank my mentors and collaborators here. And I want everyone to know that these slides are available on SlideShare here, or you can email me, and I'd love to discuss uh, this further with you. Thank you.